Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. Hello, I'm Marina Yevshan, co-host of the Russia-Ukraine War Report Podcast, and today is March the 18th, 2024. It has been 3,703 days since Russia started covert military operations in Crimea, 10 years and 27 days since the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, and 2 years and 24 days since Russia expanded its war of aggression. Today's podcast looks at events that happened over the weekend and is, once again, combat only. During the podcast you will find the Russia-Ukraine war map helpful to visualize the areas discussed. A link is in the podcast description and the ROM-up updates. The Russia-Ukraine War Report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from our direct contacts and journalists in Ukraine, the Russian Ministry of Defense, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine Morning Reports, Operational Commands North, South and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geospatial experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian male bloggers and social media channels with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission – the truth. Because the truth matters. Here is the daily assessment. 1. In our assessment, the preordained election of Vladimir Putin has cemented his rule for life as a de facto dictator, and he will continue to dismantle 70 years of political and social reform from the Soviet and post-Soviet eras. 2. In our assessment, free Russian liberation forces have established operational goals in Belgorod and plan to carry out attacks beyond reconnaissance in force and harassment attacks. 3. In our assessment, Ukraine is systematically targeting Russia's oil refining capability to cause economic harm and degrade Russian mobility. 4. The United States House of Representatives will not advance a bill that will provide additional financial and military aid to Ukraine, unless there is an unforeseen event that changes congressional leadership before the 2024 elections. 5. The inability of congressional leaders to agree on additional support for Ukraine is worsening European instability. It will ultimately encourage further acts of aggression by the Putin regime within and beyond Ukraine. 6. Based on statements made by Russian President Vladimir Putin and his proxies, and the actions and inactions of Ukraine's allies, the world remains in the early stages of the mutually assured destruction and stability paradox. 7. Multiple analysts and media agencies have aligned with our earlier assessment that Ukraine's air defense capabilities will be critically reduced by April due to a lack of munitions. 8. Russia maintains the initiative theater-wide, but the second phase of the 2024 winter offensive is reaching its culmination point. 9. In our assessment, Ukraine's shift to a Fabian strategy to wear down Russian combat power has been effective. 10. Russia has significantly improved its intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities ISR, and fire control, enabling more successful attacks against mobile targets. 11. While the possibility of an intentional nuclear accident caused by Russian occupiers at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant remains low, the condition is more serious than what the International Atomic Energy Agency is reporting. 12. Russian-aligned assets have co-opted the ongoing Polish border blockade, which has become an open act of hybrid warfare against Ukraine and the Baltic states. We begin today's war report in the Donbass, starting in northeast Donetsk Oblast. In the Solidar Area of Operation, or AO, Russian attacks on Rozdolivka continued, with no change in the situation. Further south, in the Bakhmut AO, Russian forces were pushed back further from Bogdanivka, but within the existing grey area on the map. Fighting also continued in the eastern third of Ivanivske, where Ukrainian forces have stabilized their fragile defensive lines. In the Klishivka AO, positional fighting continued north and east of Klishivka and east of Andreevka, with no change in the situation. In the Toretsk New York AO, Armod continued its claims that there is ongoing fighting in the area of Shumy and Pivdenne. 
On the night of March 16th and 17th, Mirnograd was hit by three S-300 anti-aircraft missiles used for a ground attack, wounding a pensioner. Eight apartment buildings, a school and four retail stores were damaged. In southwest Donetsk Oblast, Russia intensified its attacks in the Avdivka AO, but they remained mostly supported by light infantry, with a reduced number of infantry fighting vehicles and armored mobility. Russian forces have been concentrating their attacks in the areas defended by the 47th Motor Infantry Brigade. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, GSAFU, reported a Russian assault in the direction of Oleksandropil was repulsed, and Armored reported continued fighting in the area of Novobakhmutivka. Russian forces increased the intensity of the attacks on the Ukrainian defensive line that runs from Berdychy to Semenivka to Orlivka and to Tonenka. Marginal gains were made on the southern edge of Berdychy and northwest of Tonenka, and the line of conflict on the war map was adjusted. For the south, Armored reported fighting continued in the area of Udene. Although there were no reports of significant fighting in Pervomaiska, Russian assaults likely continue. Russian troops reached the southern edge of Nevelska, and house-to-house -house fighting was ongoing on the first street of the village. The situation has become critical. Selidova was bombed by Fab 1500 UMPK glide bombs by the VKS, Russian Aerospace Forces, wounding two civilians. One bomb failed to explode and was defused by explosive ordnance disposal engineers. Fighting continued in the Vuhledareyo, where 23 of the 63 Russia-initiated ground attacks were carried out. While the operational tempo is high, the intensity of the Russian attacks is reduced due to an ongoing operational pause for resupply and troop rotations. Attacks continued east and northeast of Krasnohorivka, east of Georgievka, and on the southwestern edge of Pobeda. South of Novomikhailivka, another company of Russian mechanized infantry was defeated before reaching the line of conflict. Three tanks and four armored vehicles were destroyed, and six more armored vehicles were damaged. We'll link to the video in the sitrap. There's more information in the podcast description. In Zaporizhia oblast, Armut claimed that it had captured the village of Myrna. Two problems. First, there are three Myrnas in Zaporizhia oblast, near Melitopol, Tokmak, and a speck on the map southwest of Huleipola. Second problem. All three were already under Russian control. In the Urikhivyo, fighting continued northwest and west of Verbove and west and south of Robotina. There weren't any significant changes to the line of conflict. The International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, provided an update on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, ZNPP. IAEA inspectors reported there were continued explosions and the sound of fighting, quote, not far from the ZNPP. On March the 13th, the IAEA recorded the sound of 13 outgoing artillery rounds by the plant, in violation of nuclear safety principles. Quote, what once seemed unimaginable, military activity near a nuclear power plant has become a daily reality, Director General Rafael Grossi said. On March the 13th, the IAEA was notified that a drone landed 550 meters outside the perimeter, approximately 100 meters from the off-site diesel fuel storage tanks for the emergency generators. The inspectors reported there was a shallow 70-centimeter-wide impact, but only bits of burnt plastic and some foil debris were found at the site. Director Grossi said, quote, There was no impact on nuclear safety, adding, The IAEA is unable to confirm if the event was the result of a drone attack or other type of projectile, unquote. Reactor 5 remains in hot shutdown despite earlier promises to move the last unit to a cold state. There was no update on boric acid, coolant water and oil leaks at reactors 1, 3, 4 and 6. Inspections of the rooftops on units 1, 5 and 6, the reconnection of the online radiation monitoring systems, a comprehensive maintenance plan for 2024, or if the IAEA will be allowed to do a walkthrough of turbine and maintenance halls 1 through 6. The world is worried about Putin's empty nuclear threats. The real danger is in Energodar.
and it is not getting enough coverage. A lot has happened in the Black Sea, occupied Crimea, Mykolaiv and Odessa since my last podcast. It has been 13 days since any Russian warship has entered the Black Sea. The Kremlin ordered a stand-down after the Project 22160 cover Sergei Kotov was sunk, and Russia has not launched a Calibre cruise missile in 40 days. With the new command of the Navy, the chain of command is likely awaiting new orders. Minister of Defense Sergei Shaigu was in occupied Sevastopol and appeared to have inspected the remaining vessels trapped in the port. Shaigu ordered that training for uncrewed surface vessel attacks be increased and that the remaining warships have additional machine guns added. I have an even better idea. Go home. On March the 17th, the city of Mykolaiv was hit by two Iskander M short-range ballistic missiles, SRBM, killing one and wounding eight, including an 11-year-old child. Russia used a double-tap attack, striking the same area approximately five minutes after the first missile hit. Ten apartment buildings, 50 private homes and trolley tracks were damaged. On Friday, after I recorded the podcast, Russia also used a double-tap attack to strike Odessa. After an Iskander M SRBM struck a residential area and first responders had started rescue and firefighting operations, the second missile struck. The attack killed 21, including three first responders, and left 75 wounded, with 40 in hospital and 8 in critical condition. On Sunday, at least one Iranian-sourced Shahid-136 one-way drone struck an unused agricultural warehouse near Odessa, heavily damaging the building. In the Moldovian self-declared Republic of Transnistria, video recorded an out-of-action Mi-8 helicopter being hit by a one-way drone at Tiraspol military airfield. The helicopter hadn't moved since 2003 and was visibly missing parts. In our assessment, this was a pointless and poorly executed false flag attempt. Shortly after the video appeared, the illegitimate government of Transnistria attempted to blame Ukraine. The Bureau of Reintegration of Moldova stated that Ukraine was not involved and called the drone strike fake and a provocation. The main defense intelligence directorate of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, UHUR, released a statement saying, quote, The main logic of the Kremlin's actions is informational incitement of the situation, since there is no corridor to Transnistria in Russia to carry out military provocations, unquote. In Kishinev, a man threw a Molotov cocktail into the yard of the Russian embassy and was quickly arrested. He told authorities he threw the firebomb because he was unhappy with the actions of Russia. The situation along the Russian front remains dynamic, and more refineries were knocked offline. On Saturday in Samara, two refineries were attacked by Ukrainian drones. The distillation tower in Sizren was hit at least twice, destroying the unit. We link to a video showing the damage. The AVT-6 unit was capable of processing 8 million metric tons of oil a year, 70% of Sizren's total capacity. In our assessment, the distillation tower will need to be replaced, which could take more than a year. Almost simultaneously, the Rosneft Novokuybyshevsk refinery was also hit, severely damaging the intermediate distillation unit but missing the tower. Novokuybyshevsk was capable of processing 8.8 million metric tons of crude a year, and it will take weeks to months to repair the damage. On Sunday, the Neftyperigonny Zavod refinery in Slavansk on Kuban in Krasnodar Krai was hit by seven Ukrainian one-way drones, with no response from air defense. The distillation tower was hit at least twice, despite Russian claims that only four drones were involved and debris landed on the refinery. Russian officials reported an employee died of a heart attack, and Russian sources confirmed that, quote, damage was recorded in the atmospheric and vacuum blocks of the plant, unquote. Like in Sizren, repairs will take months. Since January the 25th, 12 Russian refineries have been attacked, 
including six in the last eight days. Ukrainian drones took the night off. On Sunday in Moscow, the Damadedeva district was attacked by Ukrainian one-way drones. Local videos indicated there was almost no intervention by local air defenses. One drone punched through the roof of a warehouse approximately 12 kilometers from the airport, but didn't cause significant damage. It's time to talk about what's happening on the Russian border. In the Sumy oblast, pro-Putin Russian forces conducted 65 missions targeting 15 settlements using artillery rounds, mortars, grad rockets and one-way drones. The center of Velika Pesarivka was hit by nine OMPK glide bombs, 14 rockets fired by helicopters and multiple artillery strikes. The mayor, Lyudmila Birukova, appealed for the remaining residents to evacuate. The center of the town was destroyed, including the cultural center, a library, a hospital, a school, 15 homes and a multi-story mixed-use building. One civilian was killed in the attacks. The city of Sume was hit by two S-300 missiles used for a ground attack, damaging civilian infrastructure. Residents appealed online, quote, Almost no one talks about our region. It's real hell here. And how many are now spending most of their time hiding in basements. Konotop was also hit by a rocket attack, which damaged civilian infrastructure. The mayor, Artem Semenichin, reported there were no casualties. In the Kursk region, despite Russian claims, geolocated video showed that intense fighting was ongoing in Tyotkina. Russian troops near the border with Ukraine were under mortar and drone attacks. A video released by the Freedom of Russia Legion that our analyst geolocated showed major damage in the settlement and Russian troops scrambling for cover. In the Belgorod region, the Freedom of Russian Legion secured the village of Kozinka. During the fighting, the commander of the pro-Putin forces engineering and technical platoon 245 was taken prisoner. Despite all of the evidence, Armut claimed, quote, all attempts by the DRG to penetrate into the border territory of the Russian Federation were stopped. The department claims that attacks in the area of the village of Kozinka were repulsed. Unquote. Let's see. Words without evidence from Armod or four geolocated videos. This is easy. Free Russian forces control most of Kozinka. Free Russian forces supported by Echkeria volunteers also liberated Gorkovsky, removing the Russian flags and occupying the school. We coded the settlement as liberated from the Russian Federation. Video on the morning of March the 18th showed the school was still occupied, with liberation forces freely moving in the open. Moving to assessment. Last week our analysts believed that the attacks would wind down and that assessment aged like room temperature milk. Normally, a small settlement on the border of Ukraine wouldn't have much significance, but it appears free Russian forces have set an operational goal to capture the settlement of Golovchina, six kilometers to the north. From Gorkovsky, an abandoned, heavily forested railroad grade runs straight to Golovchina, with a chain of small reservoirs protecting the east flank. The Prigozhin Line, a defensive complex similar to the Surevikin Line in southern Ukraine, is between the two villages. Historical satellite images showed that the approaches to the Prigozhin Line weren't mined in September 2023, with clear evidence that the fields were harvested. And unlike the Surevikin Line, the structure appears to be mostly anti-armor. If free Russian forces can break through at Kozinka, and if there is enough combat potential in Gorkovsky, an advance in two directions toward Golovchina becomes possible. If Golovchina becomes threatened, pro-Putin forces will be forced to withdraw from 32 kilometers of border with Ukraine, including six small villages, or be at high risk of encirclement. We will continue to monitor the situation. A Ukrainian Mi-24 hind-attack helicopter that was providing close air support to the Free Russian forces was shot down on Sunday. We don't know the status of the crew. The city of Belgorod has been under almost continuous shelling, rocket strikes and drone attacks for five days. 
frustrated residents held fragments of Russian air defense missiles and have started to wonder why Russian state media isn't reporting on the situation. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers and analysts is funded by readers, listeners and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. Here is my theater-wide update. On March the 16th and the 17th, Ukrainian air defense shot down 14 of 16 Shahed-136 one-way drones. Video from the Odessa region could have been from World War II, with searchlights moving through the sky and heavy machine gun fire. The video showed two Shahads were intercepted. An analysis by Twitter user Hatri Frog using data from Andrew Perpetua showed that Ukraine's advantage in one-way drone strikes was growing in March. For strikes against infantry, Ukraine has grown a 2 to 1 advantage that is accelerating. The widening gap provides significant evidence that the initiative to build 100,000 drones a month has been successful, and Russia is struggling to keep up. On March the 7th, the Minister of Defense of the United Kingdom, Grant Shapps, cancelled his visit to Odessa at the last minute, after UK intelligence determined there had been a security breach. London believed Moscow had become aware of his trip and feared he would be targeted like the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, was on March the 6th. On Saturday and Sunday, Russian forces intentionally jammed the GPS signals of 873 commercial flights in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, Sweden, Denmark and over the Baltic Sea. In one incident, Russia interfered with the Ryanair flight for over two hours. The NATO charter does not consider GPS jamming by itself as an act of aggression or war. Moving to assessment. The ending of United States military aid and doubts about the U.S. elections has significantly emboldened Russia, which over the summer was jamming GPS signals in Romanian territorial waters. While periodic signal jamming has occurred since 2022, in the Baltics it has become almost continuous since December 2023. Moscow will continue to push the boundaries of international law, and is creating an environment where the risk of a civil or military accident is increasing. To be blunt, a lot of the responsibility belongs to Speaker Mike Johnson. The Ukrainian 425th Skala Assault Battalion has deployed with the United States M1117 armored mobility vehicles. The wheeled M1117 was pledged in 2022 and was reportedly delayed until 2025. Congress held hearings in late 2023 for an explanation from the Pentagon, and the bottleneck appears to have been cleared. Greece announced a military aid package that includes 2,000 Zuni rockets, 180 Hydra-70 rockets, 90,000 90mm anti-tank munitions, anti-aircraft weapons, and 4 million rounds of small weapons ammunition. Greece is also selling 70 M1114A1 155mm towed howitzers from their inventory to the Czech Republic for transfer to Ukraine. Several reports, including from the Wall Street Journal and The Telegraph, reported that Ukraine's air defense capabilities were reaching a critical state. By April, only one in five missiles could be intercepted. We can't verify an 80% reduction in capabilities by April, and even if we could, we wouldn't share that information to support operational security. We do agree with the assessment that Ukraine's air defense is in a critical state. The Wall Street Journal reported that the Czech Republic has found another 700,000 artillery shells for Ukraine from third-party nations, bringing the total available to 1.5 million. Enough funds were secured to purchase 300,000, which are expected to arrive no later than early June. The total cost to secure all 1.5 million rounds is an estimated $3.3 billion. Germany and Portugal joined the Czech Republic Ammunition Initiative over the weekend, with Slovenia pledging $1.1 million 
and Portugal pledging $110 million. There was no progress on either discharge petition, as Congress was not in session over the weekend. Finally, here is the update from the land of Mobix, Mobilization and Mir. In news that should surprise no one, Russian President Putin won the sham elections, securing over 87% of the vote with the opposition dead, imprisoned or not permitted to run. I'm surprised it's just 87% and not 147, as it used to be. This will be the fifth term for the Russian leader who had the constitution changed in 2020 to permit him again and serve a six-year term. Putin is president in title, cementing his rule as a de facto dictator. Czech Foreign Minister Jan Lipavsky called the elections a, quote, farce and parody. And U.S. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said, quote, The elections are obviously not free nor fair, given how Mr. Putin has imprisoned political opponents and prevented others from running against him, unquote. Countries sending congratulations included China, the Autonomous Serb Republic of Bosnia, the Vatican, Nicaragua, Cuba, Myanmar, North Korea, Syria and Venezuela. In contrast, at the time of recording, over 60 countries had condemned the forced voting in occupied Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, Kherson and Crimea. Voting was marred by protests, arrests, people setting polling stations on fire, a woman setting off an explosive in Perm, another woman pouring blood in a ballot box in Belgorod, and multiple incidents of green dye dumped on ballots. And that's what we know. Your support of my home, Ukraine, helps us make history and protect the future for all. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.